Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best of the best to help you scale your business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today's guest is a very special one. Her name is Genevieve Swenson, the co-founder and CEO at Nice Healthcare. Welcome to the show, Genevieve. Thank you, Mike. It is such an honor to be here today. Likewise, uh, your track record speaks uh, for you, and uh, and I'm sure that the audience will really enjoy a lot uh, learning from you, uh, as I did in our previous conversations. But uh, for the ones who didn't have the pleasure to meet you before, so who is uh, Genevieve? All right. Well, um, as Mike mentioned, I am co-founder and chief operations officer at NICE Healthcare. I am also a family nurse practitioner um, with many years of direct patient care experience. So I knew from a very young age that I wanted to work in healthcare. I spent a lot of time during my formative years helping my family care for my ailing grandparents. And that really over time just pushed me to wanting to work by the bedside as a nurse. Um, I ended up, after a couple of different stints in the hospital, landing in a surgical intensive care unit in a large hospital in northern Minnesota. The vast majority of the patients were those who had had open heart surgeries or other vascular procedures, generally the end effects of diabetes and or heart disease. And after seeing all of the pain, stress, and expense of those procedures and the ICU stays, I realized that I was really seeing the failures of our healthcare system. And I started to think about, you know, how could I be a part of preventing these issues rather than caring for them after they had developed these significant problems? So I went back to school and after several years um, became a family nurse practitioner. I decided to go work at a busy rural family practice clinic in an underserved area where I felt like I could do the most good. You know, this was my chance to really work in prevention and, and help people to be healthy. Um, unfortunately, I very quickly began to see that I wasn't going to be much more successful at preventing disease and disability and encouraging that wellness like I really wanted to, um, even in this primary care setting. You know, in the United States, we have, um, you know, most of our patients come to us in this insurance fee for service model, mm -hmm. and it really didn't allow for the time with the patients that I needed and that they needed. Right. We didn't have the quick and easy communications after and between visits. And there was always the concern of expense for the patient that made it extremely prohibitive for them to want to come back and see me, you know, more than one time because they were worried about how much it was going to cost. You know, and that's not, you know, not even to mention the fear of the bill they would get if I wanted or recommended lab work to be done or imaging, you know, they often couldn't even afford to to take necessary prescriptions because of the cost. So it was really hard to, to ever get them to that steady state, that healthy state. Um, mm -hmm. And this revolving door of patience and feeling like I was never gonna be able to make the difference that I wanted to make, started to weigh heavily on me. And I just, I just kept thinking like, there has to be a better way to help people. Um, so, you know, in all of my free time, I started to research alternative models of care, started to dig in, like, are there companies that are that are doing things differently? Uh, and interestingly, I just I stumbled upon a Facebook post by a, a former undergraduate classmate. So this was years, years previously uh, that I had gone to school with her. And she was talking about this company that she was also a nurse practitioner now. And she was talking about there's this company that, um, you know, had a different different model of care. They were, you know, bringing the care to patients. They um, uh, were using nurse practitioners um, to the full extent of their abilities. Uh, so I was super excited. I messaged her with a bunch of questions. And, and she actually never messaged me back. Um, we, we actually laugh about that today because we still work together. She's at Nice Healthcare also. But anyway, um, I, I did not give up though. Like I saw this model of care and it spoke to me. And so I reached out directly to the CEO, um, Thompson Adarin Comey, who's actually my one of my current co-founders now. And um, he did get back to me, but he told me there was no job available. Um, so, but I didn't give up, you know, persistence paid off and eventually I was invited down to meet him in person. I passed his little interview and was offered a weekend only position. Um, so I was still working at this other clinic, added weekends, but it was worth it in my mind because I got a chance to see, you know, to work in a new and innovative model of care. 
Um, and the one thing you know, I didn't even think of before I started there was I had never worked in a startup. I didn't know what a startup was. I didn't know what a startup would feel like. Um, and I, you know, every day I was learning something new. I mean, Google was my best friend. I was you know, writing down things, looking them up, like just trying to understand this, this lingo and these terms and raising money. And there's just so many different things. And um, I quickly found that my passion was in operations and, and clinical leadership. I was able to start to contribute to the building of the company. Um, when I had started, we were just closing our seed round. Um, and then, so then I was able to be a part of raising our series A and all that went along with that. And it was, um, it was just such an experience. Uh, you know, unfortunately for that particular company, it was only a few short months after raising our series A that the board decided to remove the co-founders. And then a few months after that, the company actually was just closed completely. So that was, it was a really difficult time for me. It felt like one of the lows in my journey. Um, but I was 100% convinced that the model of care was not the problem. Uh, so Thompson, as I mentioned earlier, and my other co-founder, Allison Santos, and I knew that we could take, you know, from the lessons we had learned, you know, what, what worked well, what didn't work well, what mistakes had we made along the way when it came to right. choosing investors, all of those kind of things, um, we could put them together and make a successful company of our own. So um, after that company closed, we spent the next several months, you know, getting organized, building our business plan, finding some clients. <laughs> um, and then in October of 2017, we saw our first patients at Nice Healthcare. And really since that time, um, things have just taken off. We have experienced enormous growth geographically, the number of patients, the number of team members, uh, and just so many wonderful, you know, learning opportunities along the way. Congratulations! The the purpose uh, is is amazing, and uh, also the the example of not giving up and keep going and going for a, a second company altogether, especially after a, a traumatic situation. It's it's not for all. So congratulations for and the three of you for being able to unite and uh, and go forward with uh, with the idea so tell us more about nice healthcare what is kind of the product the business model the the main um, ideal customer profile so let, let us know a little bit more about about the company itself yeah, yeah absolutely so um you know, I've already mentioned, you know, a few of kind of what I consider some of the failures of our healthcare system, uh, you know, yep. minimal access to, to care the expense. You know, and we had, we had done additional research and, and saw that, you know, estimated that patients were waiting over a billion hours a year for medical care. You know, that was wow. scheduling, driving to, waiting in medical clinic, medical clinics and the healthcare deductibles, they just keep going up and up. And we're not getting any healthier in America. <laughs> like, People are, are not doing well, you know, and, and part of that, there's there's other reasons, of course, but a big chunk of that is because they either can't afford or they don't have the time to access primary care. Um, in America, we don't focus as much on primary care as I feel like we should. I, I think we put a lot into, um, you know, chronic disease management and surgeries and things, which are all necessary. But if we focus more on primary care, could we avoid some of those higher cost debilitating situations, right? So our solution was to create a technology driven full service primary care clinic, but without a physical location. So no bricks and mortar, which is how most um, most clinics in the United States are on. Um, yeah. yeah, and is owned and operated by nurse practitioners um, and provide medical care in the comfort of the patient's homes. Uh, we use online video or chat visits. So that really allows people to, you know, quickly hop on with their, their clinician. Um, you can chat in between visits. So there's, you know, we have our own HIPAA compliant um, created uh, like an app that our patients use to talk to, uh, talk to our team. And they actually can get a response during our business hours in less than five minutes, which wow. for most clinics is, is unheard of. Um, and then what I think is really special from our model is we go from that online video or chat visit. Um, and then if you need that additional assessment, you might need a lab or, or um, you know, another, an x-ray or anything, we'll actually come to, to the patient. So we go to their home, mm -hmm. we can go to work, we can go to daycare, we can go to school. And we, we, 
you know, make it so that patient doesn't have to leave what they're doing. We come to them and we really make that convenient for them. Um, yeah. So currently our, like in terms of the business model, our largest yeah. group of patients come to NICE as, as an employer benefit. So mm-hmm. we sell it directly to the employer at an at a per employee per month fee. So everybody in that company is, is listed, you know, they can see NICE. Um, this gives them access to the medical services to the employee and all of their dependents. So that one fee covers that whole family. Um, and that includes That's unlimited care visits. So they no longer have to fear paying, you know, for every time they, they talk to their, their provider. Um, so those videos, chats, in-person visits are all included in that. We also have over 35 labs, 550 free medications, x-rays. We have like top of the line care coordination. So within our, in our healthcare system here, it's very complicated. Like Mm -hmm. it's, we have these care coordinators that will really be that center for that patient and they will help them, you know, get to any other type of care they might need, collect their information, answer questions for them, just, just really be a, a resource for the patients. Right. And then we also have physical therapy and mental health therapy visits. So that's mm-hmm. all included in that fee. Um, so we feel like we're taking care of kind of all of those, those pillars, you know, mental health and the, the community support and physical therapy mm-hmm. and musculoskeletal, just everything that a patient should need to to reach their goals. Um, And one way we're able to do this is we don't accept any health insurance. So that helps to cut down our administrative burden quite a bit. Um, It doesn't, we don't have some of the restrictions then that health insurance might put on a patient. And obviously we are avoiding their deductibles. So they don't have all that extra money to pay. Um, We, as I mentioned, we employ nurse practitioners. We also have physician assistants, the mental health therapists, physical therapists, mobile care technicians, which are nurses that are really skilled at phlebotomy and lab collection and and just make that part of the experience really wonderful for our patients. Um, We operate with full service. So that would be all of the virtual pieces and in-person visits in um, multiple cities across nine states so far. And then we're virtual in several other states. And we're planning to expand to full service in more states in late 2022 and throughout 2023. Um, The distribution is handled by insurance brokers on that primary service line to the employers. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned with avoiding insurance, we just really work to keep administrative costs as low as possible. Um, we consider that key to our financial success. We do this by avoiding the cost of a bricks and mortar clinic, avoiding insurance, as I mentioned, and then right. also really being smart with technology. Like what can technology accomplish for us that, um, you know, otherwise we maybe would have to, to hire uh, another service or, you know, hire a person to do. Oh. Right. That's that's a very intelligent business model uh, and, and the products and the packages. The way uh, you are able to not be dependent on uh, insurance, it's really something uh, very difficult for the ones who need to go through the pain uh, of submitting and understanding what is included, not included, as you said. Um, so that's that's really uh, amazing. Let's move into the founding team, and, and every single founder uh, is that they, or any executive that's a scale up now that is thinking about starting their own uh, startup might be thinking, what should be the right mix in order to start up a digital elf startup? So, what are the responsibilities of uh, the free co-founders on the business at the moment? It's nice healthcare. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I've already mentioned them by name again, but it's Thompson, Adair, Comey, and Allison Santos. And, you know, I I can't emphasize enough the importance of finding the right co-founders. You know, in our case, we were, we'd already known each other and we knew that we could work together because we'd both, or all three of us had been at the previous company. Right. And we knew that we were, generally speaking, like pretty nice people. So I think that's important, <laughs> right? To kind of like each other. But in order to successfully found a company together, we knew that we needed more, more than that. Um, and so when we started talking about the company, we really broke it down into three big buckets that we felt were extremely important. Um, And we knew that between the three of us, we could each manage these buckets based on our skills and experiences. So we had clinical operations, which was 
which is, right. was me, um, finance and growth, which is Thompson, and then client engagement, which is Allison. And um, early on, and so we had lots of discussions about, you know, how, how do you have three co-founders and how do we make this work? And early on, we agreed that although we would always be there for each other, of course, to support, encourage, advise in our different areas, we agreed that each of us would be the ultimate decision maker in our individual departments. And that even if one of the other two of us maybe didn't fully agree, we would, we would defer. And that would be, that would be the end of it. Um, we knew that each of us, that was our strengths. Like we had the backgrounds for it. Um, and, you know, we didn't, weren't going to allow it to turn into some sort of, you know, argument that would maybe end the relationship. Nice. Um, I think, I think people can be drawn together because they share, you know, many of the same passions, ideas, backgrounds, and talents, right? Like you might work together every day and, and you're all like, oh, we have this idea that we could, we could change this or we could do that. Hmm. But, you know, and it probably does work for some founding teams, but we found that each of us having these kind of unique skill sets and different backgrounds and also different right. networks was really incredibly beneficial because in in an area that one of us might not be as strong we always knew that another one of us would be incredibly strong in it and so it just really allowed us all to to play into our strengths and not let any of our you know maybe weaker areas um, bog down the company yeah. That decision is quite complicated to understand what are the functions that we might be able to hire a little bit uh, later on the process and the ones mm -hmm. that are really nuclear and that we really need in order to start up and, and make progress in the in the early days, right? For instance, I would say that for a consumer um, clinic, um, marketing would be uh, critical uh, in, in a sense, right? And in your case, it's um, B2B via employers. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's another kind of uh, of model, but a lot of issues here to to consider. At the same time, if the founding team is too is too big, uh, I would say maybe four, five, six, uh, it might be even more complicated to to align. So three is uh, the magic number, uh, usually, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I I know a few people along the way thought that maybe three was even too many. And I know that I've been told that it's very unique that five years later, after you know, raising pre-seed seed series A, like we're all we're all still working together, here. Yeah. We're all still together and and we all still genuinely like each other. So um, I think that's great, but definitely, you know, as you start to get larger, you have, you know, more ideas, um, more, more personalities, like it's over time, it, I could see it being more of a challenge to keep everybody aligned. Exactly. And that's that's one of the pains of uh, scaling up the company and especially this transi transition from, as I like to call it, from the founding team into the leadership team, uh, version one, version 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, uh, because scale ups and, and startups change a lot and go through cycles uh, and typically those cycles kind of six months are uh, three years in a normal company or one year it's kind of four or five years uh, in a in a normal clinic because we we should not forget that what we are trying to do is to uh, of course fulfill a purpose uh, and at the same time uh, get compensated by fulfilling that purpose and making that happen by creating a company that uh, has uh, at least an hundred, an hundred million dollar potential uh, and a billion dollar uh, valuation mm -hmm. in in less than a decade. So, which which is not easy at all to be able to double uh, revenues every single year, and especially in digital health, being able to revenue. Um, to double revenues and at the same time having high quality and not forgetting our purpose and our ethical code. Uh, that's that's one of the challenges, but at the same time, one of the most gratif gratifying par parts of, uh, of the job, because if we do things right, um, we will be able to impact so many lives with this new model of care, as you said. So what were those positions on, on that transition from the founding team into the leadership team? Um, and how has been the process of, of doing this transition? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, you've already kind of 
alluded to this, but, you know, a good leadership team can really make or break a company. Um, and so when we decided that, hey, you know, we are going to raise our Series A, we knew that we had to grow our leadership team. The co-founders and I, we were, you know, wearing too many hats and leading departments that maybe weren't our primary strengths. So we had to look at, um, you know, where, what did we want to stay focused on? Like what did Allison Thompson and I, where did we feel right. like that was our passion, our strengths? And then what areas could we break out and, and find amazing leaders? So some of it came from ideas that we were going to bring in house after we were going to raise series A. So we knew we wanted to start um, doing our own technology in house instead of outsourcing. So we needed a, a technology leader. And then when you have technology and you're building your own, you really need a product team. So we needed a product leader. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted a, a people leader. So, you know, we added people leader and then exactly. we had experience and, um, with Thompson, like he was our finance and growth and, and we know CEOs that they have just so much to do with you. Know, they have to make sure the money's there, right? So they're always Same meeting way. people, and always doing this and that. And so we needed to bring in finance to take that off of his plate. Um, so we we added we added some really great leaders, um, which you know that brings in ex different expertise and experiences. But of course, it's also really challenging uh, because now you're faced with. All, you know, it used to be kind of the three of us, maybe four of us, like <laughs> easy communications, like we were always, you know, on, like on point with each other, but now you have new leaders and they need to have communications. They need to give you their thoughts and you need to consider how all of your decisions will affect them and their departments and different decision makers might not always agree with you and you might not always agree with them. So how do we work through these disagreements? Um, you know, see so you, we always talk about like the phases of team development, right? This forming, storming, mm -hmm. norm performing. Exactly. But in a startup, it's like at hyperspeed. <laughs> <And if you're, laughs> you grow so quickly, you add so many leaders at once. And yet, I mean, we need people to start, like these teams need to perform like, like yesterday, you know, like you don't have time to spend years to get to know each other and get to know how we work together. Like, so, I mean, I think that's one of the, the many reasons that at NICE, we spend a great deal of time and energy on continually discussing culture. Um, you know, we, we talk about what we need to do as goals, you know, OKRs, KPIs, but mm -hmm. culture is always one of the top conversations we have. You know, we need to assume the best of each other, own and learn from mistakes and move on, you know, love one another the way you and they want to be loved. And this constant reminder of why we are doing what we're doing and how we should be treating each other during the process has really, I think, been vital to growing a solid, productive leadership team in in startup speed, you know, like right. quickly. Yeah, and I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the, that you talked about that uh, when we were discussing the founding team and now again into the leadership team, which is kind of the decision-making uh, matrix, kind of creating a standard operating procedure in order to make decisions uh, as a team, as at the founding team level and at the leadership team level. Uh, because as you said, uh, disagreements will always happen and uh, we need to be clear who makes the decision in those cases so we don't get block it again speed is so important is a very important element in a high growth uh, startup uh, that we, we we can't be blocked uh, there and really really important the culture uh, component and not only the okrs and having clear the mission the vision the values i know that every single founder um would, would would be listening to this and say, yes, of course. But I think that's for the ones who have been starting up and really scaling up would say, yes, this is definitely important and much more important than what I thought in the beginning. So I knew that that was important, but not so important as it is, really is, right? Yeah, definitely. So let's, let's move into kind of Another exciting uh, component of, of the lessons learned uh, when we scale up a company, which, which of course are the, the fundraising components. I know that's one of your co-founders is more dedicated uh, into, um, into that process, but what's, what, what has been some of the lessons that you have been learning through your multiple rounds, the, the pre-seed, the seed, and, and uh, more recently, um, the 30 million A round, which is, uh, a huge uh, round. Congratulations. Yeah. So I, um, because I knew you were going to ask this question, I've really been thinking through 
these lessons. And I, I think it's so important that when you create your business plan, like from day one, um, to make a version where, where you'll be bootstrapping, like kind of indefinitely, like I think, you know, thinking about investment is great, but also like have that idea of, you know, what do you mm -hmm. need, even if you were never going to work with an investor. So I think that helps keep you grounded and makes, makes you really focus on what are the absolute necessities with any money that you, you have, whether, you know, and any revenue, that you'll have coming in. Um, I think that gives you a really solid base on your company. And I think that also looks good if you do decide to go the investment route. Um, I think it also helps you to kind of dig into what are some other forms of funding besides investors, you know, the traditional loans, lines of credit. I mean, even things like crowdfunding or, or family loans, like, you know, it makes you scrappy, I guess is how right. I would explain it. Um, and then I think it's important to create versions of what your business plan would look like if you took investment money. Um, we always created a version A, B, and C. You know, so you had your bootstrap, you had, you know, um, maybe a small investment and then a larger investment. You know, what would that look like with your shares? What mm -hmm. would that look like? like? What could we do with that? And then don't you know, consider it more of like a living document. Don't be afraid to continually tweak that over time as, as you learn more, as your revenue has changed, or, you know, maybe you've added different things, you've opened new markets, whatever that looks like, your business is constantly evolving. Um, and then when you do consider taking on investors, you know, ask yourself, will this help you reach more of your goals? Will it help you reach them significantly faster? You know, what's your goal end game with your company? And really be clear about knowing what you'd be willing to give up and why you're looking for an investor. Um, you know, are you concerned with keeping control of the board? Uh, you know, we learned a hard lesson that way when the previous company, the board was able That's to right. remove the co-founders within just a couple of months. So that was something that was, you know, close to our hearts. Um, are you right. concerned with owning like a certain percentage of your shares? Are you looking for an investor that want like typically wants to be more participatory in your day-to-day -day activities? Like they're going to really dig into what you're doing and they're going to have a lot of opinions on that. Or do you want one that acts in more of an advisory role, kind of when you reach out to them for help? Um, you know, we did a lot of researching into, you know, potential investors' portfolios, what kind of companies and what kind of founders do they invest in? And obviously you want to look at, you know, what happened to those companies? How did they do? Yeah. Um, and then when you do make that decision, um, just be prepared for many, many meetings, questions, endless paperwork, and, uh, and really the possibility of some disappointment. Like every company that you meet with and invest a lot of time in, even if you had eight meetings with them and they requested your, you know, uh, they requested your paperwork, this and that, like it, it's usually it ends in a no. I mean, that's just how like investors are like, you know, so no matter what type of investor you work with, investor money just comes with expectations too. And you need to be prepared for that. There will always be, you know, someone else that you, you're you reporting to and, and they they expect certain things out of you. Um, so even if you have an investor that's more laid back, it's still going to change um, some of what you're doing in your process. So yeah, at NICE, we had many, many discussions about whether we wanted to raise funds or mm -hmm. to continue bootstrapping, kind of pre-seed. Um, and it came down to, like, it, but at the same time, we always had that bootstrapping plan. Like we always were like, you know what? We don't need to take money, mm -hmm. which I think allowed us to be choosier with who we did eventually end up taking money from. Um, but we came down to, you know, we wanted to expand our geographical reach and grow faster with each of the different raises that we've done. Um, you know, that first pre-seed seems so small now, but it was so important at the time. Um, <laughs> you know, that allowed us to, to expand out of just Minneapolis, St. Paul. So then, you know, we, we had a huge share, or, you know, huge part of Minnesota. So all of a sudden, like our Minnesota numbers, like we're a huge market in Minnesota. So then we're able to show like how successful the model can be. And it makes the second raise easier and the next raise right. and so on and so on. So know what you're going to do with that money and then do it, <laughs> like use the money for what you say you're going to use it for. And um, then you can show investors that you're responsible, that um, your model is working and so on. 
Um, but I would say we were also very clear when we were going through the investment process about where we were or were not willing to bend on things, you know, things that board seats or shares or things like that, you know, um, right. we knew that we would every time would have to, you know, kind of meet compromise on a couple of things. Um, but we had those just couple of things that we were, we weren't willing to give up on and eventually, you know, we would meet the right investor and we did. And I think we were really blessed to find investors that fit so well into our culture and supported our visions, you know, throughout, you know, our first investor was Indy.bc and pre-seed and seed. And then we added conduct ventures and waterline and adding them to our board, you know, nervous about it, right? We've never had investors. They have been incredibly valuable. Like they have contacts, they have experience, like they, um, they've helped us. Like, that's what you want out of an investor, right? You don't want somebody who's going to slow you down. You want somebody exactly. that's going to help you, help you grow faster and more efficiently. And it's been really great. And then now in our series A, it's, it's early, but we are absolutely convinced that we've added like another just fantastic group of investors. Um, there was a few, but this round was led by DNA Capital. Love it. And by the way, just to give context into the audience that didn't have the time to check nice healthcare on, on Crunchbase, uh, kind of the, um, the pre-seed check, they, they, they were, they, there are two, right? The 350K plus the 750K from indie vc then the the seed round it was in two stages with uh, five million from waterline ventures and six million from conductive uh, ventures and now the last rounds the series a round the 40 million uh, a round as, as you said from dna and capital uh, the data is correct uh, uh, genevieve yeah <laughs> just sure <laughs> Yeah. Just for the ones who are listening, I know that sometimes people are busy and or walking or running while they listen to the podcast. Uh, good to get a context from where the, the advice uh, is is coming uh, from. And by the way, just, just a curiosity uh, in the first round, we are seeing that the playbook, of course, is changing a lot in the last um, years. And, and uh, even now, we, we don't know how the market is reacting to the infl inflation and uh, and other macro trends, but um, were you able to raise a pre-seed round with uh, with a PowerPoint and, and some data, or do you already have some kind of traction when you raise the the pre-seed round? You no, know, well, so Thompson, um, having gone through um, you know a Series A and and seed and pre-seed with the previous company, definitely had some contacts out there right. in the VC world. However, you know and. <laughs> the the original very first investment with indie.pc really came out of a Twitter communication. So awesome. um, yeah, Thompson didn't know, uh, didn't know them previously, but he had followed them on Twitter and really, really liked their model. They were, they were different. They invested in different kinds of companies. They, they were kind of a, like a new age investor. They weren't so traditional. And, um, and I, I don't remember the exact comment but essentially Thompson ended up commenting on something they had you know tweeted and they ended up having a conversation and then it, it led to some meetings and um and they ended up being just a fantastic partner for us it's the way it started cool any before we go into the last segment of the show where we ask quick questions and uh, ask for our guests to also uh, share quick uh, answers any final tips that you'd like to share? Any topic that we didn't cover during the show that you think it would be important for the ones listening to to know? Yeah, absolutely. I am. Um, so I think it is so important to have um, you know a support system. Obviously, your own family is is important because you're you're going to be you know having long hours sometimes or lots of meetings, but really having a community that understands um, what you're going through. So I feel like the startup world is vastly different world than most people live and work in. Um, it can be you know, really all encompassing and can feel like no one outside of the startup really understands what you're going through. Um, so I found that for me, um, it's been really important to have a trusted community of people that actually do understand what I'm going through and where our company is in a stage and where we're trying to go. And um, you know, for me specifically, it, it could be people that have you know, worked in the digital healthcare space, especially startups, um, have started their own business, are, are a nurse in leadership or a female founder, like just um, people that 
I don't know, can just help you keep going when you feel like you can't do any more. Um, you know, I've just learned so much from peers and really believe that putting yourself out there a bit, which is hard to do when you're so focused on growing your company, just trying to find that extra time, but it, it really is worth it. Um, it helps to keep me going. It helps keep me sane throughout all of the challenges um, that the company and I face. So that's one thing I would definitely recommend for anybody looking to start a business or in the middle of um, growing a business. That That's a great one. And thanks for sharing that, uh, Genevieve, because definitely it makes me think of the quote from Jim Ron: we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. So if we, we want to raise up or uh, improve our level of, of, of our game, we need really to surround ourselves uh, with people uh, who are on the same path and if possible, a little bit ahead uh, of us so we can uh, learn from them. And, and definitely for the ones who are outside of the tech ecosystem, uh, it might uh, seem crazy when we start talking about numbers and issues and what we need to prove and what we'll be raising next and that we are trying to create all this monster uh, in such a, a short uh, period of time, even sometimes with some team members who are not familiar with uh, VC, I think there is a lot of education that we need to do in order to explain them what is the VC game uh, about and what are the rules of the game, right? And we are using yeah. those rules of the game to be able to generate an impact um, because going through bootstrapping, the impact that we would create would, would not be um, so quick uh, and would not be so uh, impactful. So great points. Just wanted to emphasize these two reflections as well. So um, advice to your, uh, or I would say in a, other words, if you would have a coffee with yourself at the beginning of nice healthcare, what advice would you offer to your younger self? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, The Butterfly Effect, it's like 20 years old, but it always stuck with me um, where like a tiny little change, you know, flutter of a butterfly wing could lead to big, big changes in your life. So exactly. I would definitely wouldn't tell myself to do anything differently. However, I would like to tell myself not to not to get down if things go wrong or I make a mistake. I, it's difficult when you're in the middle of it happening to realize that all of these kind of trials and tribulations and failures actually help you to grow to be the person that you are today. And, you know, and all of those have helped to lead me to where I am. Love it. What are you the most proud of uh, on your uh, journey so far? So coming from the nursing world, most of the focus during all of those early years of my career and for, for me and my fellow nurses was patient care and you know, how can we be better caregivers? Uh, very little was spent on leadership and even less on entrepreneurship, like it was never anything I thought of. Um, but since creating NICE, I have been able to see multiple you know, other nurses, other clinicians step into leadership roles and, and really excel at them. So it makes me incredibly proud to have created a company that gives people people that might traditionally be overlooked an opportunity for leadership in their careers. Love it. Worst advice ever received. So um, we get, obviously we get lots of opinions and, and oftentimes they don't, you know, they just don't really work with our model or whatever. Or thank you. And you just don't listen to them. But uh, kind of a, a more personal example for me is um, one time, like I, you know, worked really, really hard seeing patient after patient. And I kind of got the courage to schedule this meeting with a clinic administrator. And I had been there for a couple of years. I felt like I knew, you know, what was going on. I wanted to share my thoughts about ways we could improve some workflow processes and some culture concerns. Um, but when I met with him, rather than actually discussing anything I had suggested, he used this like weird, horrible twist on the 80-20 rule, um, the Pareto principle. Uh, yeah. He told me that he could only, you know, his job, he could only make 80% of the company happy and the other 20%, which apparently was me, I didn't realize I was that 20%, but um, would never be happy and that he wasn't going to, you know, take the time or, you know, take any action on the suggestions I'd made. I was um, pretty shocked at the time. Uh, but in the end, when I look back on it, I that moment, like it always sticks with me. And it was a huge motivator for me to have the courage to step out, look for something different and to eventually create my own company and vow that I would never write off the suggestions and satisfaction of 20 percent of my company. Congratulations. Favorite book. 
Yeah, um, I really enjoyed the book Permission to Screw Up by Kristen Hadid. Um, it goes back to that advice I give to my younger self where great things can come from, from failures. You know, give, your, give yourself permission to screw up from time to time, but be quick to forgive yourself when you do mess up and then use those screw ups to grow and avoid making that mistake in the future. So many, so much fellow here. I, I need to replay the podcast when I go for a run. So favorite <laughs> movie or series? Yeah, so I don't have a lot of time to watch um, TV and movies by myself. So if we do sit down, it's with my husband and my kids. Um, right now we're in baseball season. So we've been kind of watching some of our classic baseballs like the Sandlot. Um, and our favorite series, we really enjoyed Outer Banks on Netflix. Love it. And finally, the favorite podcasts, of course, excluding uh, Skill Up Valley. Yeah, um, oh, I love true crime podcasts, but that's not necessarily helping with the business piece. Um, okay. So I recently started listening to a podcast called Health Matters. So H-L-T-H -H Matters. And it has some love really it. great content. Love it. Uh, thanks again to Alex for suggesting to ask these questions at the end of the show. It's being amazing to, you know, collect a lot of uh, resources so we can also explore and, and share with the community. Uh, Genevieve, thanks so much for making the time. It was really a pleasure to have you on the show and you are always welcome to, to share your journey with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. This was great. And to our community, uh, as you see, we keep bringing you the best of the best uh, to make it a little bit easier for you on this uh, amazing journey that is to start and scale up a startup. So see you soon and keep scaling.